Hello and welcome. I'm Eileen Fuchs, the new president and executive director of the National Building Museum. I'm thrilled to virtually greet all of you and welcome you to the continuation of an important new program series focused on climate action. We are fortunate to be co-hosting this series with our 2021 Honor Award honoree global design firm Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, SOM. In fact, inspired by SOM, we've transformed our annual award event into a months long call to climate action, which includes this series, as well as at a, at a dynamic virtual event on June 17th. So mark your calendar. We hope you'll join us and New Jersey Senator Cory Booker, Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti, and Massachusetts Senator Edward Markey, co-author of the Green New Deal, and to be inspired to be part of this critical conversation. The National Building Museum tells stories and inspires curiosity about our built world, the places where we live and work and play. By doing so, we create new ways in which people interact with the world around them. Our past storytelling in the climate change space includes the 2003 exhibition, Big and Green, Towards Sustainable Architecture in the 21st Century, our Smart Growth Series, and our For the Greener Good Series. That we have shifted our language about environmental topics from green to climate change since that 2003 exhibition shows just how urgent and critical things have become. With this program and with SOM at our side, we continue a series of thought-provoking programs that explore the role that architecture and the building industry must play in addressing the global climate crisis. The series continues next Thursday, June 10th with the program Investing in Our Future. In my new role here at the museum, I'm learning all about the generous people, companies, and organizations who support our programming, including this panel discussion. Before we get to the heart of the program, in addition to our panelists, I wanna thank and recognize Amazon as the NBM Climate Action Series and Honor Award Presenting Plus sponsor, DPR Construction as our keynote sponsor, and Clark Construction as our steward sponsor. If you enjoy what you see in this program, please consider becoming a member, which will get you access to the rest of the series and the June 17th Honor Award event for free. In addition, you will receive early access and discounts to other programs and events and discounts at our award-winning museum shop. If you're already a member, thank you so much for your support. And now, it is my pleasure to welcome our moderator, Yasmin Kologlu. Yasmin is a design director at SOM's New York office. She adopts a forward-thinking and holistic approach to design that integrates well-being, environmental design, and technology, and is a strong advocate for equality, diversity, and innovation in the design industry. Please welcome Yasmin. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. And it's a privilege to be part of this important discussion today and represent SOM during our third climate panel also. Tonight, with our esteemed panelists, we will discuss the role of green innovation in our building industry's response to climate change. Climate change continues to be one of the biggest challenges of our time. We are seeing the global temperatures rise at an unprecedented rate due to our greenhouse gas emissions. Currently projected at 3.2 degrees Celsius at the end of the century. This is more than double the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal. As a consequence, environmental challenges are growing exponentially, demanding immediate and innovative solutions to lower our emissions globally. 40% of these emissions come from the built environment, including both carbon emissions from materials and construction, as well as during operation. And 40% is a significant number and shows the size of our impact. So we must take action quickly and at scale. Our actions in this decade are key for the health of our planet and its people. As an immediate response, many of us in the building industry are already working, designing towards carbon neutrality by 2040. On this path, we recognize that our efforts are, should and will be, shaped by green technologies and innovation. The recent Net Zero report published by International Energy Agency outlines how existing technologies and those under development will shape our net zero future. The report clearly states that the path to net zero emissions by 2040 is narrow. I quote, the deep emissions cuts hinge on an unprecedented green technology push in this decade. It requires an immediate and massive deployment of all available green technologies that exist today and also requires huge leaps in green innovation in the future. In fact, almost 50% of future carbon savings rely on technologies that are under development today. Finally, the report also calls us to action 
to make the 2020s the decade of massive clean energy and green innovation. So now with this, I'm excited to turn to our amazing panelists tonight. And each one of them is actually already making the 2020s the decade of massive innovation. Their work and initiatives represent some of the most influential green innovation efforts and advancements in our industry. Some of these include electrification, advanced battery systems, biomaterials, carbon cure and storage technologies, and of course, related policies and incentives. Tonight we have Will Schrubar, Francesca Wall, Chris Needle, and Robert Niven joining us. Without further ado, I would like to pass the word to our panelists for their short, short introductions. Will, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you very much, Yasmin, and hello, everyone. Uh, before I begin, I just wanted to say thank you uh, to Yasmin, to SOM, and the National Building Museum for hosting this event and for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, as Yasmin mentioned, my name is Dr. Will Shrubar. Um, I am first and foremost an associate professor at the University of Colorado Boulder, where I lead the Living Materials Laboratory. Our mission is to integrate biology with traditional construction material science to create and grow low carbon and carbon storing and even living material technologies for the built environment. Uh, Yasmin, uh, next slide, please. I am also a co-founder uh, and managing director of Aureus Earth, uh, a new carbon marketplace for building and infrastructure projects. And I am a co-founder of Prometheus Materials, a construction uh, biotechnology startup. Uh, the best way for me to introduce myself and my point of view is by sharing the question that inspires me to jump out of bed every morning. Can we grow carbon storing buildings? It is my belief that the future building stock, namely the materials with which we choose to build, can be part of the climate solution. Uh, next slide, please. As Yasmin mentioned, the materiality of the built environment has and will continue to have tremendous environmental consequences. Most people are surprised to learn that concrete is the second most consumed material on earth after water and that steel and concrete production alone contributes more than 11% of our global greenhouse gas emissions. These facts coupled with the fact that we will be building a New York City every 35 days for the next 40 plus years, uh, let that sink in. Um, all that to say that materials uh, matter and the environmental impacts of those materials matter and they matter now. Um, of course, I'm talking specifically about upfront embodied carbon, uh, the carbon emissions associated with the manufacture, transport, and installation of construction materials, really the pulse of carbon emissions that um, are emitted uh, that, that's associated with material manufacture. It is feasibly possible to make materials that store more carbon than they emit. And if we balance the carbon emitting materials with uh, enough carbon storing materials, and we can actually transform the built environment into a carbon sink. There are two primary mechanisms we material scientists can exploit to grow carbon storing building materials. Uh, Yasmin, final slide, please. The first is photosynthesis. In fact, one kilogram of any photosynthetic biomass, whether it be trees or plants, Straw, seeds, even algae takes about 1.83 kilograms of CO2 from the atmosphere uh, to grow it. Uh, the second mechanism is carbonate mineralization in which we basically grow limestone by reacting calcium uh, with, um, with CO2. Um, it takes 0.44 kilograms of CO2 to make one kilogram of limestone. There are many emerging technologies based on these mechanisms, and I'm sure we'll get into some of those, but the moral of the story is that growing carbon storing materials and carbon storing material, start carbon storing buildings is possible and buildings can certainly be part of the solution uh, to the climate crisis. Uh, thank you. I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Um, what I thought I would do in my introduction, uh, I, I'm uh, the co-founder of a, a, um, a grassroots volunteer network called uh, Open Air, and we focus on advancing carbon dioxide removal technologies 
uh, both through collaborative uh, policy uh, activities as well as citizen science. What I thought I would do is just spend the next couple of minutes introducing a subject that I think is very pertinent uh, to, tonight, to tonight's discussion. And um, I will um, probably be referring back to it as an example during our discussion. Uh, carbon dioxide removal, I think we've entered the a period where we've come to understand that the data points to the fact that we can no longer just rely on uh, mitigating emissions or stopping emissions uh, or adapting to climate change. We also now have to be actively pulling carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, Sorry, a little bit of delay. Uh, a number of reports point to this. I think there was a sort of a, a, a milestone a couple of years back uh, with the publishing of the IPCC Global Warming 1.5C report uh, that was the first real meta-analysis to really, I think, uh, bring this into focus. Uh, so in order to maintain safe temperatures, uh, we're looking at enormous amounts of carbon that will have to be removed by mid-century and by the end of the century. 10 by the middle, 20 by the end. That sounds like a lot, 20 gigatons, and it is. Just to give some perspective, uh, all of the cars on the road in the United States right now uh, produce roughly about one gigaton of carbon. So it's a Herculean task that's before us. And many of the solutions that we know are in the portfolio for carbon removal are very familiar to us. Um, uh, uh, reforestation and afforestation, um, increasing soil carbon. And both of these biological solutions um, come with many different co-benefits uh, that are just inherently valuable in their own right for ecosystems and for agricultural production. And they're cheap, but they're not enough. That's an, another finding that we've has settled in and been unsettling for some. We also will have to be relying increasingly, and depending on how, how successful we are on other fronts, in engineered solutions that are purpose-built to draw carbon dioxide from the atmosphere chemically. The one that you've probably heard most amount, which is both inspired hope and uh, and, and, and some uh, fear, uh, honestly, is direct air capture or DAC. Um, direct air capture has some unique benefits in that it, of all the CDR uh, options, it has what you could call the largest upside in terms of the amount of carbon that it could theoretically pull from the air. It operates on a small footprint by comparison. Uh, it's about a thousand times more efficient than trees in pulling carbon dioxide in terms of space. And it can be metered in real time. So we can have certainty of how much carbon we're actually removing uh, in real time and over the long term. But the problem is, it's among a few other things, but the, the primary barrier is it's very expensive and we need to bring uh, the cost for direct air capture down. But we have history of doing this, and I think this is one thing to discuss tonight, I hope, is that we've, the technology changes, uh, innovation um, changes. Uh, uh, we have the, uh, oops, sorry, we have the possibility uh, to accelerate the rate at which price comes down and performance increases. And one key way to do that is through policy interventions, both uh, in terms of R&D and supporting demand. Um, and I think the question with direct air capture right now is less a technical question. It's whether or not we have the political will and focus to incorporate CDR and generally and direct air capture into our portfolio of solutions. And as I'll bring up in the conversation today, direct air capture has real bearing, I think, and significance for the built environment and the urban environment. So I hope we can get to that during today's call or discussion. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yasmin, for, for inviting me and for the National Building Museum for uh, hosting this event. My name is Rob Niven. I'm the CEO and founder of Carbon Cure Technologies. Um, Carbon Cure, in many ways, is a combination of the last two presentations, uh, where there was a discussion by Will on embodied CO2 emissions of the built environment, and then later by Chris on carbon dioxide removal technologies. So we're a mission-led company to reduce 500 million tons of CO2 um, from the built environment by the year 2030 using carbon dioxide removal technologies. Specifically, we use carbon dioxide to make concrete concrete with improved performance, but also mineralizes CO2 during its production, thereby allowing concrete producers to be part of the solution by providing deep environmental benefits to the built environment. And this is not a technology that's uh, of the future, but one that is already available today. The technology has been uh, used, uh, such as the plant behind me here, uh, in a little over 300 plants that are now operating. Uh, over four different continents, supplying thousands of projects, including uh, locally within the Washington DC area, the Amazon HQ2 project, which we're immensely proud to be part of the portfolio of low carbon solutions that are being used. 
Uh, on the topic of embodied CO2 emissions, uh, it's a particularly relevant to look at concrete. Um, concrete uh, would be the primary contributor to embodied CO2 of buildings. And embodied CO2 would be around 50 to even 80% of the total, geo, um, the total CO2 emissions of buildings over their life cycle. So it's very important that we act urgently to be able to decarbonize materials that are being used in concrete. And Carbon Cure is one such solution that can be deployed today and at scale. So once again, thank you very much for having me uh, on the panel today. And I look forward to some of the questions. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Francesca Wall. I'm really excited to be on the panel tonight um, and learn from Rob, Chris, and Will. Um, my role at Tesla is focused on the public policy side. So I spend a lot of my time on the day-to-day -day basis really looking at building and transportation electrification, um, focused specifically on the build out of electric vehicle charging infrastructure, um, as well as local work focused on building codes, permitting solutions, and other mechanisms to help um, accelerate the deployment of renewable energy, so solar and storage for our products, but also just generally um, renewables in the market. So. At Tesla, we're really all about our mission to accelerate the transition to sustainable energy um, and really focus on innovation to do that. And so um, we're obviously known as a big electric vehicle um, company and a manufacturer of electric vehicles, but we also have a lot of other product segments that sort of try to tie together this whole ecosystem um, from the way we produce energy all the way to how it's consumed. And so my role tonight on the panel is really more focused on the policy, public policy side of things and thinking through um, the regulatory framework that has to be in place in order to enable innovation in the built environment and really create this um, net zero carbon pathway. And so I'm looking forward to kind of discussing that angle um, and thinking about policy levers that can both push things forward, um, but also um, sometimes mechanisms that may hold things back. And how do we enable technology to still thrive um, with a well-defined regulatory environment? So looking forward to discussing more um, and diving right into uh, the meat of the topic. Thank you, Francesca. And I feel like we can talk about each one of your intros for about an hour, uh, just to begin with. Uh, but as I think we, uh, our National Building Museum is putting us on spotlights here, um, it, it's a, it's a, climate action has become a part of our daily life as architects, um, engineers, and design professionals. And many of us are taking proactive steps towards reducing carbon emissions. And, in, the, in this action, what do you think the role of new technologies is? What role should they play, um, especially particular to the built environment? And maybe we'll we start with you because you already hinted at this in your uh, intro. Yeah, ha yeah, happy to, to um, offer my perspective. Um, I think with any problem, there's no one silver bullet solution uh, for carbon neutrality within the built environment. And actually, I, I like the, top, the title of this panel, which is rethinking, uh, you know, rethinking technology and maybe our relationship um, with it. Because I, I think even the concept of a silver bullet conjures up the wrong kind of technologies that will be part of the solution. Um, so, you know, there are certainly new shiny technologies that maybe Francesca and Chris can, can talk, can speak to, but there are are going to be technologies, material technologies that are not shiny at all. They're actually artisanal solutions um, that we bring into the 21st century and make modern. Uh, so materials like straw and adobe and earth and bone and hemp um, and other agricultural wastes. You know, most people think we, we're only talking about wood when we talk about photosynthesis and growing things, but people have been using low impact materials for millennia. And it's really about bringing, our, bringing those into, um, into today and tomorrow and putting our 21st century stamp on centuries old building technologies. I really think that's the innovation, a lot of the innovation we'll see, and it's the innovation that we need. 
Right. And it is, is it, so it is fair to say, I guess, that uh, uh, I think the answer is low tech and high tech at, at times. Um, and I'm also curious to hear maybe a little bit about, Chris, uh, you're, you're, you know, some of the technologies that um, uh, we're talking about, such as uh, carbon capturing technologies, are fairly new. And they're often also um, conceived as large technologies that do not apply to urban scales. Um, so sometimes it's seen as a rural application. So what do you think the role of some of these new technologies um, in the urban environment can be? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think I come from a, a long solar background. I spent, um, you know, my whole career up until a few years ago um, in various different positions in the, the solar world in various different places in urban New York and rural India and Afghanistan and got to sort of see um, that technology really exceed expectations almost in every single way in terms of its cost reduction, about 30 years ahead of schedule in terms of where it is now in terms of pricing. And I think a big key to that, while the image I have behind me isn't exactly helping because it shows a large industrial object that's pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, but the reality is that I think that a big part of the future of things like direct air capture are not going to be these large industrial uh, units that are you know placed out in the middle of nowhere uh, where our reference point is more uh, refineries or power plants. I think that there's enough evidence to suggest that um, modular technologies that can be distributed uh, and integrated into the built environment are, are likely the ones that um, not only solve the problem of space, uh, they can also capitalize on waste heat, and waste energy, uh, but they also, they move a lot faster. Um, they can, uh, there's, if you look at solar and you look at batteries and you compare them to uh, hydro or nuclear, um, the, the learning rate, the rate by which innovation happens and price goes down, the more smaller and solid state and simple the technology uh, tends to be correlated with those kinds of advances. So while I think we're sort of, because it's so new, our frame of reference is we think of large industrial because it's such a large problem. And there certainly will be some of that with direct air capture, but I think that the future will be probably more solar-like. I think we will see it distributed as a feature of things. And that's built environments, that's buildings, and that might even be uh, products. Right, right. And actually, um, I, I, I'm wondering if there are some parallels we can draw. And I know, Francesca, you're involved in many of the elect electrification efforts. And electric vehicles were maybe a good example of this back in the day. It was a new technology, although it's widely accepted at this moment in time. And future is definitely looking that way. Uh, so I'm wondering, um, do you think there are parallels that you can see with where some of these new technologies are today? and where I guess electrification of cars and vehicles were, was in the past. And uh, do, you, do you see similarities and what are the, some of the challenges or obstacles that you might also perceive here? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And I would say, even though electric vehicles seem to be this mainstream kind of accepted technology, adoption right in the US is at less than 2%. Um, and so that's part of the kind of discussion we think a lot about internally is um, a technology is only so great in that it's actually adopted. Um, and so I think part of that is um, appealing to the consumer. And so oftentimes when we're thinking about whether that's solar storage, um, electric vehicles, uh, it's really how do we create something that consumers will want to adopt, um, but that's also um, fairly simple in terms of uh, the adoption timeline and, and how much it takes to, um, to overcome the hurdle to utilize that technology. Um, and that probably also is, is true at scale when you're talking about commercial product, products at the same time. Um, you know, we have large scale battery storage. Um, that we're working with larger commercial customers on, and um, we have those same discussions. But part of the, the role that I have in sort of thinking through that is how do we design policy that helps drive that? Um, and so whether that's at a consumer level, um, so um, you know, we talk a lot about tax credits and all sorts of other tools, but even um, smaller than that, just making sure consumers are aware um, of the technology and what role does policy uh, provide to drive that awareness. Um, so uh, again, a lot of my work might be in, in this policy arena, but it's really focused on the consumer angle of that. So I think there are definitely some parallels that can be drawn here from these other types of technologies and what we've seen in the electric vehicle and the solar and storage space. Right. 
And, and interesting that you mentioned that because historically building industry is not seen to be a, a very progressive or somewhat of a conservative. We are seen to be a conservative industry. And to make this kind of change uh, requires consumer demand, market demand change as well. And I, maybe I want to turn to you, Rob, on this because you have one of the most interesting and maybe maybe wider, widely used technologies. We are presenting the carbon cure technology for concrete. So curious to hear a bit about your experience and um, do you see the market demand? Do you see where it's going? And what are some of the uh, opportunities that you see in this space in particular to our industry? You know, I, would, I would certainly agree with some of the prior comments about using a, a retrofit and modular uh, approach to being able to scale faster, uh, such as solar. And uh, that's certainly a pathway that we've taken where CO2 could be captured from the large industrial unit like behind Chris or, or other sources of emissions or, or even biological sources of CO2, but we have to do something with that CO2. Um, and we would then turn that into concrete uh, for products and, and we retrofit those plants uh, rather than having to build new ones. A key thing though about scaling up though is creating that consumer demand. And uh, there is also the challenge is there are thousands of, of uh, separate projects and for millions for that matter, um, design teams and uh, specification and procurement processes that are inherently broken. Uh, there are so much, there's so much leakage within those uh, procurement processes where um, specifiers or owners or engineers may select a certain uh, uh, material or approach, but you know, that only requires one individual along that construction chain to, uh, to choose a different path. And uh, that concept is lost and those opportunities for CO2 reductions is lost. Um, so I, 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 would, I would look where you can get the as you'd say, biggest bang for the buck. And I think that takes us to government procurement. And uh, I know this is something that Chris will have an awful lot to talk about on this, on this session, but what we really need to do is um, work by combining procurement, government procurement uh, with some of their um, carbon, uh, carbon goals. Uh, certainly, it's a very powerful lever where you can accelerate the deployment of these technologies in a non-prescriptive way that gives those market signals. In the case of concrete, government would procure about 40% of all concrete, so by far the single largest customer. Um, so with that power, they can, they can create rapid and permanent structural change to this industry uh, by using their procurement power and removing some of the regulatory barriers. So I, I think the market does have a very important role here to accelerate the transition. Uh, otherwise, I just don't think we'll get it done in time. Right. So, I mean, it's a very good point that I think, yes, private sector has a role, but you're highlighting that I think government also has a role in the procurement and some of these new technologies and R&D also. And you mentioned that um, Chris will have an opinion on this. So let's turn to Chris, maybe, uh, if you don't yeah. mind. And I think on the government procurement side. Yeah, absolutely. I've, you know, I mentioned that our group is primarily an advocacy group. We focus a lot on the state municipal level, which is, I think, um, we can get into that, but I think the, those levels of government are somewhat uh, underappreciated, I think, uh, in terms of the impact they can have in driving new innovation. But yeah, we've been working on a bill in New York and also in New Jersey and hopefully in a few other states soon that would require uh, the state to implement an incentive mechanism for low carbon concrete, uh, essentially a discount that is applied um, to the, the price of a bid uh, artificially to make it seem cheaper or less expensive based on its life cycle analysis score, its, its uh, EPD score. And we think that that uh, is a great way to get going. And it's also a great way to not just have the public sector, you know, dictate what, what those solutions should be. Um, we think it really always continuously points towards innovation, uh, focused on low-hanging fruit, that things that have been in the marketplace for a long time, but making sure that uh, the private sector always is an incentive to keep implementing new technologies as they emerge. So, but I think generally speaking, you can just look at the history. I mean, concrete is a special case because as Rob said, the, the percentage of it that's purchased by the public sector is enormous. So the decisions that governments make in regard to concrete can have huge reverberations, um, you know, in the private sector, in addition to um, decarbonizing their own footprint. Um, but I think that applies to carbon dioxide removal as well. I mean, I think that what we're seeing uh, in states and in cities that have signed up and have on the books um, really stringent, uh, aggressive, uh, uh, emissions reductions or net zero goals by 2050, 
as you're trying to implement that, you're looking for any way you can squeeze carbon uh, out of uh, the environment. And I think um, for something like carbon dioxide removal, I think it applies um, on those scales. But to get it going right now, uh, we need the government to start creating that market and to actually follow the lead of what is happening in the private sector with Microsoft, Stripe, Shopify, uh, and other corporates that are starting to, uh, to, 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 tr to start buying carbon, uh, adding that to their strategy. So I think if we have that happening on the state and federal level, um, that will really amplify and accelerate things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a good point. And maybe this brings us to make our next question. I, I was going to ask all of you, this is a question for all, actually. Do you think that we have the right policies and incentives in place uh, to promote innovation, but also implementation of some of these new technologies at scale? And what type of, if not, what type of policies you think are needed? If I, I would just add one thing, again, reflecting uh, the sort of solar experience is that we, we have to focus on the, the big picture levers that the federal government can uniquely pull, but we can't, uh, when it comes to putting things in the world, in the built environment, uh, we have to focus on what is happening in the ground in local jurisdictions. And sometimes those things are quite boring and they involve the second floor of the Department of Buildings or the Fire Department. But if we wanna create habitat for these innovations, we have to be operating on multiple different scales of government. Mm -hmm. I, I think a really key question here as well, or a key element is, um, is measurement. It, it's, it's impossible to, yeah. to apply policies uh, or a regulatory change without actually knowing what the numbers are. And, and that's uh, certainly a challenge that, that we see in the construction industry is the, the lack of transparency of environmental impact reporting. Uh, fortunately, the industry was, was uh, an early mover in this space by uh, the leadership of, of LEED and the U.S. Green Building Council around things like environmental product declarations, which are LCA-based tools which report the environmental impact. Um, great groups like EC3 or the Carbon Leadership Forum are then using this data to help designers uh, measure and model the embodied CO2 of whole buildings. Um, but policy is not normally informed by this level of transparency, and there's huge gaps. Um, there's actually very little adoption uh, of EPDs, or at least at the extent that it should be. So before even talking about policies, we need to know what the numbers are. And, and there needs to be a rapid sea change when it comes to just reporting and, and measuring these in a transparent way. And I would say based on a national database um, so that uh, we could all inform and start benchmarking off of best practices in uh, innovation. Mm -hmm. I, I echo, uh, to dive in here, uh, Yasmin. So I, I echo Rob's Rob's point about measurement. Um, and I, I do think that we don't have the luxury uh, of time to wait. Um, we have to do something now. And so there is some movement. Um, I do have to give uh, acknowledgement to the National Ready Mix Concrete Association for reporting um, industry average um, and even regional specific benchmarks for concrete uh, you know, per, per compressive strength category. Um, that's at least a starting point. And we have industry-wide EPDs for concrete and industry-wide EPDs for steel um, and, and even insulation foams. We, have, we, we, we really understand, are starting to understand a little bit more um, about what those average benchmarks are. And to Rob's point, the EC3 tool, um, which, is, which is basically a database of EPDs, um, is, is helping to further inform some policy uh, recommendations that the Carbon Leadership Forum is putting forth as, as industry-wide benchmarks. In terms of policies, um, Yasmin, to get at your question specifically about policies and incentives and maybe what we need to do, um, we do see movement. Um, we saw a little bit of movement with the California Buy Clean, uh, Buy Clean Act, which um, for better or worse, uh, neglected concrete. Um, and so, we do see other states now starting to adopt uh, similar bills and, and adding concrete back in. Um, Washington state has tried for many years, um, and it actually there are eight states right now who are considering uh, bu similar buy clean policies. Um, but we're starting to see local municipalities react um, and not wait for states to adopt buy clean policies. We see the Marin County in, in San Francisco adopt a low carbon concrete building code. We have the city of Portland um, adopting a similar policy for concrete. 
Um, and we, we see the Carbon Leadership Forum really advocating, uh, putting a lot of, um, uh, of effort around informing, uh, informing policymakers um, on, on benchmarking and, and what the numbers should be. Um, my research group at the University of Colorado is also uh, funded right now to establish building uh, scale benchmarks for US commercial buildings so we know, is it 250 kilograms of carbon per square meter? Is it 400? Uh, you know, what, what really is the theoretical um, benchmarks we should be using akin to an energy use intensity like EUI? We know what EUIs are, um, the DOE stands by them. Um, so we're working closely with the DOE to eventually integrate our findings in terms of embodied carbon intensity of their reference commercial buildings. So we have some benchmarks. On the incentive side, um, I'll say yes, green building programs have been good at incentives, but people pay for those programs. <laughs> people pay for those programs. So the green premiums that they're actually paying for most materials, they're not getting any money back. Um, so Chris mentioned one, uh, one incentive you know, based on EPDs and I know we'll talk about this later, Yasmin, but Arias Earth, uh, the carbon marketplace that we've created um, is, to our knowledge, the very first financial incentive for building owners to receive uh, carbon offset revenue from purchasers of carbon offsets for making those critical material decisions. And we, we just, we're in a commodity market. We need that financial incentive in addition to things like policy. Right. And I guess what stays on and in front of, what are the obstacles in terms of that we see for these policies and incentives? And maybe Francesca also, I know that, you know, it, it is something that you live every day and you think about every day. So I'll be curious to hear your opinion on, I guess, what are some of the obstacles you, you might see? Yeah, um, policy, I think the one challenge is it never moves quickly enough. Um, so the, you know, at a state level, um, two things I was just thinking about as I heard everyone else talking is, you know, building codes, great tool um, moves very slowly, um, but can have a big impact. And so buildings that are being built today, right, will be around for 50 to 100 years. And so um, by the time the next code goes into effect, we're looking at 2024, potentially. And so the technology that's be the code is being developed for today will be likely very different in the next four years. And so ensuring um, that the policy is designed in such a way that it can withstand technology changes um, so uh, I think that's that's a challenge, um, and that's really hard to do, um, especially on the on the code side. Um, and I'm happy to go into more examples later on that. But I think that's more direct policy. There's also the what I would call the non non fun or sexy stuff that's enabling policy, which is sort of at the local level, things like permitting, right? In solar, we talk a lot about soft costs, and so. Um, that can actually have a really big impact in terms of how quickly we can scale and deploy the technology out there. So um, I think sometimes there are even solutions that um, such as permitting that kind of go across all sectors, all technology types where we wanna see a streamlined process. Um, in the solar industry, for instance, we're working on something called Solar App, um, which is trying to provide instantaneous online permitting. There's no reason why that couldn't work for things beyond solar and storage and, and couldn't work for other technologies um, in the building space. So it's those types of things where there are opportunities, but they're also kind of challenges because it's it's not at the front of everyone's minds or it's moving at a really slow pace compared to technologies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I, it's a, sorry, yeah, go on. Sorry, I just want to echo that and amplify how, how significant that is. Anybody who spend any time in, in, in solar, it is amazing how uh, so many of the roadblocks are these things that just, you, you can't rally activism around because they're so, um, they're so banal. <laughs> but yet it's this huge category uh, where we need reform uh, that, that really is a, a principal barrier. And I guess you're all highlighting that we need to have good policies that are uh, adaptable, but also transferable. Many of them are also transferable uh, in a sense. 
And uh, maybe with this, I want to ask a little bit, uh, Chris and uh, Rob, I think you have both been involved. We see, we see some of uh, low carbon policies that are uh, relating to uh, materials such as concrete on the East Coast, on the West Coast. Uh, there is some, there is one actually particular one that you've been involved um, in the New York Senate at the moment. Um, and um, I, I'm wondering what are the, I think you have some firsthand experience on this. And I'm wondering what are the, some of the challenges that you saw, uh, you're seeing with this policy, for example, and what can we learn, I guess, as a private sector uh, from some of your experiences? Uh, I can take that first, Rob, if you want to. Um, we do. Um, I, I think a key thing when we're talking about concrete, people are very, it took so much effort to lock people into certain domains of action. And if you just look at, um, you know, the, the focus on the electricity sector, transportation, which, you know, makes perfect sense. But most folks in this space, particularly legislators on the state level, are very new to the idea that building materials or concrete or even a relevant subject to be talking about, you know, vis-a-vis -vis climate. So I think that the, a huge burden early on is to uh, raise a, a, a just general level of awareness, um, you know, around it. Um, but I think it's also concrete is so literally foundational uh, to civilization and it's been around for a very long time and it's so uh, pervasive and inextricable from the, the built environment and the world we know. There's, there's a sort of a caution in conservatism, I think, that even compared to my, my days in solar and trying to deal with, you know, uh, uh, per permitting uh, with Con Edison, uh, it pales in comparison, you know. So I think that there's just a a, a sort of a caution to, to make change. Um, I think there's a real risk aversion there. Uh, that's part of education, but a very specific one, I think, to, to concrete. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I would say that concrete is certainly having its moment um, in the topic yeah. of decarbonization. It's, I'm seeing it a lot in popular press. I think a lot of the work that Bill Gates has done specifically, it's one of his five questions that he asked of any climate plan is, uh, what are you doing about cement and concrete? Uh, it, it's a it's a very important contributor and, and one that um, that built the building professionals and owners have a lot to do to to manage. Um, you know, it's it uh, education is definitely a, a key a point to it all. But once you get there, then I find that you you can make progress. And Will identified a number of other policies in, in different jurisdictions that have gone forward and passed. Um, we saw the first pioneering work ourselves in the state of Hawaii and in Honolulu. Uh, where they were able to move very quickly. Uh, they had a, a relatively agile policy development environment and, and uh, they were able to pass some, some pretty impactful policies at the state and DOT and, uh, and city level that have led to a rapid decarbonization of concrete and adoption of carbon removal technologies. So it can be done. I think we need a lot more precedence. So some of these bigger economies uh, need to develop some of the confidence um, because the impact of them passing these policies is some, so much more pronounced. So I think there's a lot of work that can be done right now uh, on on smaller jurisdictions and I would say subnational to build up that momentum to use these uh, policies as you know, laboratories and learn from them and find out what works best, measure, measure, measure everything to see where we're getting the real impact uh, and then start to deploy them more swiftly. Um, in possibly at a national level. Uh, I'm Canadian and uh, am based in, in Canada and we see that there's already a, quite a lot of discussion that's happening due to the great work that's happening in the US. So it, there's ripples effect, ripple effects here that are happening uh, outside of the US from their leadership on this topic. Mm -hmm. Right. And just to add to that, I mean, I think that we, because of the nature of the problem, there's such a focus understandably on national and even sort of global decision making, uh, but you kind of have to go where there's the will. And I think where there's the access from an activist point of view, it's much easier to start to kind of penetrate and influence thinking at a state municipal level and get those sort of points on the board. Uh, you know, as Rob said, it really is get something going in New York and then try to push for its hor horizontal spread. And that can be a lot faster and you can see a lot more innovation on policy thinking, I think on that level. And then that can vertically actually influence what's happening at the federal government. Um, we see that in the U.S. context all the time. Right. And, and with that, maybe I want to pivot to Will uh, briefly. You're, you're involved and considered one of the lead scientists in some of the biomaterials. And on the, you're on the more the research and development side of things. Um, and 
Um, and today, actually, I was reading a news about Katera. Maybe some of you have seen it. Um, Katera, who, who is a um, um, uh, timber construction and modular construction company, announced that they were closing. Uh, and uh, I think it was Mark Green, uh, who is part of Katera, that said that our industry is made up of relatively small scale companies without the resources for major research and development and capital investment in innovation. Do you do you think do you think this remains to be a challenge? I think the problem is very clear for us, but how do we get there it requires both market demand, policy to develop, but also this investments on research, not just projects, but investment in research and development and actually deployment of those. Uh, what, what do you think um, the opportunity here is and what where do you see us going in the near future? This is an excellent question uh, and we all know in, in, in the building industry, I'll say it again, it's a commodity market and the profit margins that our companies, our companies are, you know, are, are seeing very little, very little. We're seeing less than 1% most of the time goes to research and development. And that is very different from other, from other industries. Francesca probably can, can tell you that it's a, it's a little bit different in, in the tech industry um, and, and certainly um, uh, certainly others, not, not construction. Where I see the opportunity, however, um, is instead of companies wanting to build out R&D infrastructure is to really investigate partnerships with universities because universities have at their fingertips huge floor prints, um, uh, of footprints of equipment, uh, brain power, knowledge, expertise, um, and they can bring different insights as well as capital equipment um, to, to, to a company's R&D efforts. Uh, we have had ver uh, quite a few industry projects um, and, and we have others in development where we're partnering with folks in industry to, to accelerate their, their R&D. And I think it's a really great, it's a really great partnership and, and one that can be fruitful, not only for R&D of the tech, but also the human resources, human resources as well. Mm -hmm. And just out of curiosity, what is the percentage in other industries that go into R&D, you think? Oh, but pr probably more than 10%. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's I, a big difference. It's a big difference. Yeah. And yeah. it, I think it's a huge difference. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, there, there have been some uh, incredible announcements recently of, of, of companies um, investing in, in, in sustainability uh, R&D um, over the last couple of months, um, you know, company, not only in like the oil and gas sector, but also telecommunications. Um, and uh, so, yeah, yeah, it's quite different um, in other, in other companies. Yeah, right. Other and, industries. And I want to I want to ask you another question. Will it's, I think you mentioned Ori's Earth, and it's a very interesting concept. It's a marketplace for carbon exchange, basically. Do you think uh, places like that could also create investment opportunities, and that goes into maybe um, deployment of some of these, but also investing in some of these technologies too? Yeah, you know, our our incentive structure is set up. Um, a bit differently, where owners are incentivized, uh, much like the solar, you know, solar rebate program. Um, you know, owners are are incentivized for choosing low carbon or carbon storing material technologies. Um, but you know, what we're seeing is, is there there is a significant interest in tapping into um, in, into a program like this um, from investors. Um, and, and really changing the way that construction finance may, may actually work. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so I think that there's an opportunity there. Uh, but uh, kind of the nuts and bolts of our program is, is that we pair, we pair builders, owners, uh, with, with buyers of carbon offsets, and we serve as the third party for verifying um, that, according to our methodology, uh, a lower carbon or carbon storing material was chosen during the design phases of the project. Um, and we convert that to an offset and we sell that on uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a carbon offset, just like um, you know, electrifying a stove, for, for example. Um, we launched a pilot uh, late last, uh, we launched our um, pilot phase uh, late last fall. Uh, and we will probably 
complete our first pilot project. We'll really announce it. Uh, we'll announce it uh, likely at the end of this summer, early early in the fall. And uh, you know, I, I think this brings up a question of of, of carbon, you know, a, a question related to carbon markets and, um, you know, what where how will that eventually evolve? And and I, I will say that I do think the market. Uh, the carbon markets will change. Uh, right now, it's a little bit like the Wild West, where people are purchasing carbon offsets. Some are verified, some are unverified, um, some are voluntary, some are uh, you know regulated. Um, uh, and but we know that there will become well, there will come a time where all of the carbon marketplaces will be under some scrutiny, uh, and there will be some regulation. And when all is said and done sector-specific third-party programs that are transparent and rigorous, traceable and verifiable, like ARIA SURF, will, will ultimately remain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess in, in all of these, uh, in, in all of these the, the current market is still a maturing market in a way, and is developing every day and growing every day. And as part, I mean, we, we talk a little bit about, we started talking about the market demand and I'm I'm curious to hear also maybe Francesca your opinion on um, what role do you think homeowners and commercial tenants who are the market in in, in our industry can play in in um, uh, building electrification and provide breakthroughs in carbon reduction. Yeah, I, I mean I think similar to what I mentioned before, um, it's it's really the adoption phase of it. Um, but I think it's also someone else mentioned it and I forget who, but it's the demand um for these types of things. So um, you know, demonstrating that the technology will be utilized and it's actually better for uh homeowners or commercial tenants than what they are experiencing today. Um, is really important. And so, um, you know, I mentioned building codes and I think one interesting aspect of building codes is there is a lot of things that go into codes that are not seen by a homeowner or a um, consumer, um, whether it's a commercial tenant or a homeowner, um, that, you know, they achieve benefits from. And so um, bringing some more of that awareness to it beyond things, you know, like, uh, solar and storage, which are very visible, but things like energy efficiency, right? I used to be in the energy efficiency space, and we always talked about how hard it was to actually talk about what energy efficiency means in the in the built environment to um, a homeowner. And so um, policy can certainly set up a, a role there as well from an educational perspective, um, making sure that that messaging is, is spot on. So mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's there's still a lot of work that needs to be done um, to bring more visibility um, to sort of the, the less well-known technologies um, that maybe aren't in the forefront. Yeah, I guess some of these technologies are often seen to be too far or even utopian at times. And in fact, they're probably not anymore. Um, yeah. And um, do you think there is a nexus between the green innovation of uh, for buildings and transportation and do you th should we and could we um, could the electric vehicles be considered in achieving net zero carbon for buildings? Yeah, I mean certainly um, electric vehicles will have to be considered, um, given that you know um, if if the future that we envision at Tesla comes true, um, all buildings will uh, have you know electric vehicles potentially charging at them, right? Um, and so. Um, electric vehicles obviously inc increase the um, electricity consumption of a building. And so how do you offset that? Um, and what's the strategy to integrate that? So, um, you know, the entire ecosystem needs to be evaluated, um, but there's certainly a pathway forward where, um, you know, you can have the electrification of the vehicles and that can be seamlessly integrated. It just needs to be planned for. Um, mm -hmm and plan for today. Um, I think we're often in a wait and see scenario um, where we think, you know, as adoption scales, we will figure out how to integrate vehicles into the built environment. Um, and I think one thing we try to stress is we really need to be integrating it today um, for that future, you know, 
50%, 60%, whatever that number is. Um, and who knows what that future will look like uh, when you start talking about things like autonomous vehicles, you get into a whole nother <laughs> discussion and I won't go there here, but that's um, that's sort of how we're, we're thinking again about um, the two sectors working together, but also um, how we have to design policy to meet both those objectives. Right. And I guess we are hearing from all of you that we all need to work together. So private needs to work with government research. We need to work with our um, uh, research institutes and universities, and we need to work with contractors and clients and architects and design professionals. So I guess I think one of you started the conversation that there's no silver bullet, but it, it's going to take it's going to take a village to do this for sure. And uh, maybe one of the last questions for our before we start taking some questions from the audience. Um, would you consider the United States a leader in green technologies? And if not, what can we learn from other countries that might be considered so? I certainly would. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but I think the, the, the data is there, um, that there is, um, you know, where we might as a country sometimes um, fall behind on some critical uh policy resolutions, um, there's no shortage of, of innovation and creativity, um, uh, you know, in, in the private sector and also on in governmental levels. I mean, I think, you know, Rob could, anybody else on the panel could speak to it, but if you just look at what we most associate with green innovation, it's disproportionately um, comes from North America. We're, we're a venture capital backed company and, and as such sort of play within that arena of sort of many of the breakthrough technologies that are occurring and, um, for that matter, Breakthrough Energy Ventures is, is our largest investor, and um, uh, Amazon and, and many others. Um, so we, we get an opportunity to see where a lot of these innovations are coming from. But I, I think unlike the information technology space, which Silicon Valley dominates, uh, is, is that clean technologies are a lot more distributed. Uh, however, the US is by far the best market to scale up these solutions. So whether they come from my home country or you know, Israel or Europe or, or Asia for that matter, is usually one of the first markets to truly scale is in the US. Um, so that I, I find that has been our experience. And in the space of uh, carbon removal technology, CO2 utilization technologies, uh, just look at some of the teams that competed in the Carbon X Prize. Mm -hmm. uh, those were, um, yes, from the US, but also from all around the planet. And I think that was really encouraging to see these nodes of innovation that are all working on these similar projects and and uh proudly many of them are also canadian so i was, I was happy to see us <laughs> punch, a, punch ahead of our, our punch above our weight class so that was great i was going to say that rob if you didn't canada definitely overrepresented uh in the carbon removal world <laughs> and maybe i'll offer a, a slightly um similar similar but but um, different vantage vantage point. I, I think the U.S. is really great at at innovation. I think that there are certainly technologies um, that are available. What what we lack um, that maybe our European counterparts um, we can learn from learn from them are these uh, these policies and incentives that can help overcome barriers to scale. And, and adoption and market demand. So right now, really owners, building owners, you know, they have to pay the green premium to be able to use some of these technologies. And uh, there's really no, you know, we're starting to see it. You know, there's some policies in place that are, that are um, starting to drive uh, decisions more toward, um, uh, you know, mandating those lower carbon choices. Uh, uh, and we're starting to see incentives pop up, but you know, I think the the Europeans and the regulation that they have has really um, helped drive a lot of of um, uh, at least um, help adopt a lot of of, of new technologies and, and maybe avoid overuse of some that are that are not so great, and uh, that that has really helped um, a lot. So if we had that, um, you know, I, I think that that would be a really good. Um, really good balance to help help uh, uh, drive uh, drive our, our the scale of these technologies. Right, and it's interesting because I think in almost every question that I've been asking tonight, I think we come back to the policy. So either as a powerful tool to use, or as a tool that we need to improve, 
uh, or how, how it's been so impactful. So it shows us the clear relationship between green technologies, innovation, and how policy and incentives need to support them to actually transfer, to make them transferable, usable, widely used, and scalable. So I think quite a clear message for, for all of us and for our audience also. So um, there's a couple of questions that uh, come, has been uh, asked by the audience. Um, so um, somebody asks, what can we do to convince our clients to employ some of these new technologies that you're working on? Maybe Rob, that's a question for you. What, let's say a building professional is looking to use Carbon Cure and they would like to talk to their clients or contractor owners to um, employ some of these. What do you think the best strategies would be? And do you think the data or the information is out? How is it available to them? Well, assuming the data is there and the, and the building owner is, is looking to reduce their embodied CO2 emissions or just overall CO2 emissions of the project. If that's set, I, I think that we want to look at the data and see where the greatest impact is going to be. And that will most likely be concrete. So there mm -hmm. should be a, um, a policy that's put in place to look at reducing the CO2 emissions um, from like a... Um, what's a culture of value-based um, or bid levelization process. Um, and what I mean by that is, is looking at where you're going to get the greatest um, CO2 reductions um, at the lowest cost. Uh, carbon cure is provided at price parity. So that's something that we're able to work with other uh, efficient CO2 reduction methods. Some of them traditional, like the use of supplementary cementitious materials like fly ash mm -hmm. and slag and or limestone cements. So just what I found and many other projects have also shown this to be the true, is just asking the question. You don't have to pay more. It's just looking at the data and just asking the suppliers, the contractors to provide, um, to provide low carbon options is you can typically get around 30 to 40% reductions in CO2 intensity of concrete without a price premium. But if you don't ask the question, you're, you're just gonna get the usual, right? Where there's maybe less consideration on decarbonizing. Um, so I think it's the onus is on the producer just to ask that question. And it's really, it doesn't have to be trade-offs. You get all the same performance. Um, but these producers and contractors typically want to provide these options, but may be cautious to put them forward because uh, they may think that the owner is more traditional and um, may not be valuing these types of CO2 reductions in their buildings. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know if anybody would like to add uh, to that. I'll, I'll add to that. I, I think this is the most frustrating conversation, at least I had as a practicing <laughs> structural engineer. I wanted to use all low carbon materials. Um, I actually wanted to build uh, wood buildings, mass timber buildings, and um, it, it it's a difficult conversation to have. I agree with Rob that you should align on the, the, the owner's goals. And if they um, look at hotspot materials like concrete, you can ask the question of what could I replace the concrete with? Sorry, Rob. Uh, but there, there are some replacements of, of concrete um, like mass timber that owners you know, want to see. Like, is it a steel frame, a concrete frame, um, or a, a mass timber frame? You can put dollars to that. Um, some, of this, some of these decision carbon uh, numbers and dollars to that. And if there's a price premium, you, you call us. You call Call us at Arias Earth and, and ask us to build in the cost estimate for what the carbon offset revenue could be to that, that building owner. And then it's ultimately up to the owner to choose the, the ultimately up to the owner to choose the, the solution that aligns with their with their carbon reduction goals. Mm -hmm. um, it, the onus really is on them. Great, thank you. And I hope that answers the question from our audience on this. And Francesca, there is a specific question for you. Uh, in your opinion, what are some of the best technologies that could be implemented on the homeowner level during a new build or remodel to increase the building's overall efficiency? Great question. Um, and I will speak to this at a very high level because I'm not the technology guru um, that I may claim to be in my policy work. But um, I would say, so I'll use an example. Um, and it's something that I, I worked on. So California uh, now a couple of years ago passed a new building code that would require all new homes to have solar 
um, or if that wasn't feasible to have an onsite, to have sort of some sort of access to an offsite. Um, but that was only done after sort of the, the efficiency in the building envelope was pushed to such a high level that it made sense to go to the renewables strategy. Um, and in that same discussion, there's now sort of the next evolution, which is integrating storage um, and then integrating electric vehicle charging. So um, it's that kind of whole ecosystem. So from my perspective, um, solar is still probably, um, it, it's accessible in many, many places. I think the costs still need to come down um, to some extent, but that's sort of the, the kind of first no brainer that always comes to mind once you move into the renewable side of things. There's lots of stuff that you can do before that on the energy efficiency side um, that is all really valuable. But from a, a, a new homeowner perspective, I think integrating solar up front is, is really key is, if that's the pathway you choose. There's also other things I can, you could do passive house and all kinds of other stuff. But um, again, that one would be a standout one. Um, and then, you know, one thing I didn't, uh, touch on previously and sort of this whole angle of consumer adoption is also the, the the affordability and the equity side of things. And I think those are two really big topics um, that we have to think about when we think about scaling of technology. So that's something that, um, you know, I, I think we still struggle with as an industry um, to how do we, how do we meet those competing objectives for those folks who, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, access to, to, to solar is still a challenge. Right. Thank you, Francesca. Great answer. Um, uh, Chris, maybe this is a question for you. Um, given the consequences of out of control GHG em emissions and what little time we have, it seems too risky to hang our hats on technologies such as have been extolled here. People could be excused for walking away from this presentation thinking everything is under control in regards to the climate emergency. Therefore, no need to address this climate emergency in their personal lives through activism or personal behavior. Do you think your presentation here contributes to that kind of thinking? I hope not, but I guess what, what I could <laughs> do is, is give, um, I'm an activist. I've been an activist my whole adult life. Um, and I think that sometimes, I guess what the questioner's sort of comment speaks to, I think, is there's sometimes this um, divide that we have, that the technology is the sort of the, the alienating thing that's imposing itself on civil society, um, where I think it's actually the forms of activism that we need more of in the environmental movement are not just sort of pleas for large goals, but we need, uh, this, this is solar, solar is certainly in the electric vehicle uh, world. Uh, I don't know if it's caught on to concrete yet, but in the early days, there are these people who fall in love with the technology and they form a subculture around it. And those are the ones, that form of activism, that's almost like a fan club. It's almost like a, a support group for that technology. The story is seldom told. We get the, the tycoons in the rear, you know, when we learn about it or we think it came from something else. But if you look at the car itself, if you look at the personal computer, if you look at solar, there was always that sort of um, somewhat chaotic group of people they were activists and they were the ones who were not only the early adopters, but they're the ones who would go into those fights that we talked about before with permitting and all those things that have to get done. So I guess what I would say in response to that question is that there's a vital and necessary form of activism that is about participating in the success of these technologies. It's not separate from activism. It totally depends on activism. So I don't know if that in any way answers the question. Yeah, and I think it's also, uh, I think what we're trying to highlight here that it's not going to solve itself. This issue is not gonna go away on its own. And we have to take action on, in many aspects, we have to take action in innovation and research. We have to take, take action on investments, on uh, the de deployment of this at scale, and that relies on all of us and also policies. And I think activism and people like yourself here, and also experts like yourselves are playing key roles here. Uh, Rob, there's a question for you. Um, as of July 2019, cement production accounted for 7% of man-made CO2 emissions. How do you plan to make cement production net negative? I, I think I was looking at the Q&A. I think that question was also reworded as um, certainly I hope no one's expecting me to do this. Um, that's that's <laughs> a, um, it, It's going to take a portfolio of solutions. And I saw just this week that there was an announcement of the first carbon neutral cement plant. Uh, and, and there's gonna be a variety of solutions that are going to be used. Uh, perhaps they'll be regionally appropriate. 
Uh, for instance, in this case, they were going to use geological carbon capture and storage, so putting CO2 underground. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that, that's a costly endeavor, um, but it does provide the volumes and, and certainty. Um, but there will be a, a range of different solutions for us to get there. If you look at most roadmaps for this industry to get to net zero, and just about every cement company has announced a net zero commitment, they all have their technology roadmaps. Typically, what you see is 50% of the reductions coming from carbon capture, utilization, and storage. That uh, is typically loaded back end. Um, that shouldn't give everyone, anyone the sense of um, acting without urgency because these technologies are not going to be deployed at scale by flicking a switch, uh, whether it's large geological uh, sequestration or it's using CO2 to make products like carbon cure. Um, that's going to take time. Um, and then all these other traditional levers that we need to maximize. And one lever that no one seems to be talking about is just material efficiency. Mm -hmm. And be being a lot more optimized in, in how we say use cement, concrete, or use other resources, or thinking about concepts of circular economy. There's so much waste that we can be reincorporating back um, to replace the use of virgin materials. So a, a lot of these other ideas are all going to play extremely important components to this. But uh, back to Will's you know, first statements is there's no silver bullets. Like, I'm not going to tell you it's carbon cure. Uh, that's absolutely a falsehood. But it will be a carbon cure plus a basket of other solutions. And, um, and we need green premiums. Um, it could be carbon markets or it could be um, purchasers looking to pay small amounts more to be able to accelerate that change and we need to remove regulatory barriers because there's so many solutions out there that are available for scale but there's some arcane 50 year old regulatory barrier that stops progress from happening and everyone's too afraid to make a change to regulations mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There, there's an answer yeah no that makes sense that <laughs> makes sense and uh, i think maybe one last question for all of you any thoughts on a carbon tax and how it could be applied I guess we're seeing it applied in a way. Local Law 97 in New York it is, a, it is, is a carbon tax in its essence. It doesn't cover embodied uh, materials, embodied carbon of materials, but it does cover operational. So what are your thoughts on carbon tax? Is it coming our way? Would you support it? I think that's Francesca. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to punt uh, because uh, I, 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 if you're asking my personal opinion versus uh, my opinion as being part of Tesla, that the the answer might be different. So um, yeah, not not necessarily my area of expertise um, that I, I spend a lot of time on, but I do have lots of colleagues that that kind of use a lot of brain power on this, um, and I do think that there, this is my personal opinion, there's future opportunity there and that it's coming. Um, I don't think it's an if, it's just a woman question. Um, but yeah, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Francesca. Yeah, yeah it's, may, it's getting may, up, yeah. Maybe, maybe I can add, add some thoughts. I, I think that there, um, that the US uh, specifically uh, tends to um, drag its feet a bit on this and maybe we had four years of, of, of heavy feet dragging um, uh, on a carbon tax. But I typically the US uh, let, lets the markets figure it out, tries to try to figure it out first. Let capitalism try to figure it out. If there's a market for this, then uh, the capitalists of America will, fi will figure it out. And, and I think that th that's what, why we're seeing both voluntary uh, and, and also regulated carbon markets appear um, and and we're we're starting to see incentive programs pop up because because there there's a true um, business opportunity uh, opportunity there. If if the, if we woke up tomorrow and there was a carbon tax, it, I would think it would be placed on the material manufacturers. Um, uh, so the cement plants uh, are are the very first things that uh, that I think would would come to mind and. But there, to Rob's point earlier, there has to be a lot of data around what 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 is what is the maximum capacity per kilogram of cement, uh, you know that that is allowable, and and you know what is the appropriate tax. And I think there's just so much work that needs to be done before we actually see it be applied in the construction uh, sector to material manu manufacturers. Yes, but I am glad though that you raised the local law 97, you know 
uh, policy in New York. And, and again, just to not to sound like a broken record, but we, we have to focus on where there's a will and where there's a structure uh, right now, even if you're hacking the intent of it, like we're trying to do with carbon dioxide removal and local law 97 in New York. But I think that there's a lot of creativity and a lot of will at that level. And for early stage technology, so much of this is about deployment, deployment, deployment to you know bring us uh, down the cost curve and, and, and bring the price down. And in aggregate, cities can do that and cities talk to each other. You know, there's coalitions of cities that are sharing best practices. So I think if we could have a carbon tax and dividend policy tomorrow, that would be amazing, but I'm not holding my breath. So in the meantime, we have to make do with what we have. And I think that those are municipal and state uh, policy environments. Mm -hmm. I think this was a great question actually to end it on. And to be honest, uh, we've been involved in some of the COP26 discussions and there seems to be a lot of discussions around uh, carbon tax and COP26. So we'll be also curiously watching if anything comes out of that from the COP26, which will take place in November also. So maybe uh, to, I think we're coming to the end here and um, I would like to ask each one of you, what will be your final message for the audience? Should we start with, um, who, who would like to go first? Will maybe? You are nodding, so I'm assuming. <laughs> As I'm thinking of, of what to say, no. Um, I, I think my, so I, I, I hope everyone leaves. I, li I, like, I like the question that Chris uh, got to answer. You know, what, when you leave here, you know, what, what do I hope you take away? And I really hope that everyone here who, who is in the building industry feels empowered to take action. And I would really encourage you to join um, the Carbon Leadership Forum as a member to learn more. I, I'm an educator. I would be remiss if I didn't say we have to learn more and, and spread the word. Um, so, so learn more. There, there is on the ground bootstrap, you know, boots on the ground uh, action with the Carbon Leadership Forum in, in hubs in a city near you. Uh, and, and so I, I really do hope you feel empowered and really recognize that buildings do represent an opportunity for long-term carbon reduction and storage. Uh, material solutions are there, um, but there are some key barriers we have to overcome uh, in order for all of this to scale um, in the United States and beyond. Thank you, Will. Great message. I'll follow on that because it's, it's related, um, you know, just on the theme of participation. I mean, um, my little ragtag group, the Open Air Collective has no formal organization. Uh, but it's the people can do a lot. And I think when people are looking for activist opportunities, it's usually framed in some sort of uh, mass action or maybe a consumer choice they're making. But the creativity of average people uh, to develop, research, introduce policies and get them passed is extraordinary. And we're finding that with the Open Air Collective. And I think the opportunities for that have never been greater in the internet, in the mature internet age right now, people, uh, common, you know, communities to connect and form and do incredible things. Um, so I would say uh, participate. I am gonna plug, if you are interested in carbon dioxide debt removal, I did put the, uh, our website there and we'd be happy to have you join our community. I, I, can, I can go next if you, that's the order where we started. Um, I, I agree entirely with not only the groups that have been mentioned earlier, but the points. And I, I think being primarily building professionals in the audience today is I think it's very important to be asking for the data and to be making procurement decisions based upon on that data to, to drive the market for low carbon building products uh, as a technology company. And what was said earlier about deployment is every project lowers the cost of these technologies and accelerates the momentum of their market market transformation. Uh, so every single project counts, whether it's a sidewalk or you know, HQ2, they're all critically important. Very good point, yeah. Um, all the good things have been taken. So my final message will just be, uh, technology and policy can work together. Um, I think they're not um, on, on different ends of the spectrum. Um, but we, we need to um, make sure that folks are engaged um, in that process. And again, the, the consumer is key to that on, a, on one end of the spectrum, the regulators knowing about these types of products and, and having the um, experience with them is also key. So making sure that um, technology works with policy um, to uh, achieve the future that we kind of envisioned in this net zero carbon world. 
Right, perfect. Thank you. I mean, this has been such an amazing conversation. Thank you for joining us. And so I'd like to thank all of our panelists for this amazing conversation. And it's clear that the green technologies uh, will have a key role in our climate action towards 2020. And these are not utopic. They're no longer utopic. It is clear that with our collective efforts, uh, effective policies and investments, we should be able to expand and scale up these technologies. And uh, there is a, still a big challenge, but maybe we are, we are closer than we've ever been for this challenge. And to close our discussion, uh, we would like to thank the National Building Museum again and give the stage to Eileen. Thank you. Well said, Yasmin, thank you so much. And thank you to Francesca, Rob, Chris, and Will for this just very thoughtful and important program. To our audience, the discussion was recorded and an edited version will be available on our website in about seven business days. Please don't forget to visit our website and to visit nbmvirtual.org for a full list of the programs in this series um, and information about our virtual honor award on June 17th. Please join us next Thursday, June 10th for our next program, Investing in Our Future. And finally, as the museum's new director, I, I look forward to your feedback about tonight's program and I hope you'll consider completing the brief, brief survey that you will receive via email after this. So my thanks in advance for that. Thank you so much for joining us tonight.